Well, if you were here Wednesday night, you were treated to a wonderful concert from Westmont, Westmont College. They just did a fantastic job. And then and they were dressed in these, you know, tuxes and dresses and all. And then they, they went to the many different homestays. They got back here about 6.30 in the morning. And this is a little picture of how they looked at that time. Can you see it very well? Yeah. That's nice. I think, are there two or is it just, yeah, there they are. But they're a great, great bunch of kids. If you're like us, you found a thank you note on their bed that they had left and all that. And uh, it was really a delight and a pleasure to have them with us. Well, we are, our sermon, as you perhaps saw from the reader board, is called Pure Joy. That happens to be the title of this YouTube. I want you to take a look at it. What did she say? Grab something for me. That's what that lady said? Yes. What do you mean? Faithlin, Faithlin, I don't, there's no way. Why would they have something for you here? I don't know, maybe it's going to be an American doll. No, I don't think so. I don't know what it's going to be. Faithlin, those are so expensive. I don't think that's what it is. I don't know. Are you excited? What is it? I don't know. Look at her go. Oh what? <laughs> Faithlin? What is that? American doll. <gasps> oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> tell her, Daddy. Tell Faithlin, her. it's it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Faithlin. Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> this is A from... Real a real one from all your family, Faithlin. They wanted to give you this. It's American doll. Look at how pretty she. She looks like you. She looks like you, Faithlin. Wow. My own American doll. I just saw her face. You just saw her face. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Look at her. <gasps> Faithlin. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right, turn her around so we can see her. Let's see her, Faithlin. Oh my goodness. I am a good dog. You will never say it. Are you so happy? Yeah. Happy birthday, Faithlin. You can see why that's called pure joy. And a couple of weeks ago, we went to see. Uh, our little Luke, three weeks old, and he had that perfect middle name, and it was just pure joy to see him and to see also my daughter just, you know, being the mom, amazing. Maybe you've looked at, at Mount Shasta or Mount McLaughlin and you thought, that is just so magnificent. Something gives you pure joy. And I thought we'd make this a group participation thing. I'd like you to turn to someone sitting close to you, perhaps not someone you're married to, just go wild, and uh, talk to them about something that gives you pure joy. Go ahead. You don't have any friends. All right. That's enough sharing and enjoying. This is church, after all. Um, what's something, what, is, what came up? What are some things that give you pure joy? Pure joy for bringing Sue to church, and I get pure joy from seeing Sue in church and yourself, Georgia. Uh, other things that give you pure joy. Your life, your life, right. Music. music, wonderful music. It's just amazing when you hear something, you just go, I can't believe that I was here. That's some, some of you, that benediction at the end, when you're surrounded by that music, just you knew you were in the right space in God's presence. Other things, yes. That's so great. I'll repeat it. When she drives up by OIT going for a workout class, which is great for this message, and uh, she looks at that lake out there and says, no matter what season, it's gorgeous. 
Well, this is pretty fun, isn't it? We should just talk about what gives us pure joy, and we should be, it'd be a great, great day. Well, hold that thought, because we're going to get back to it, and I want to, but I want to position us where we are. We begin a new series this week. We have completed Just Walk Across the Room, and I hope that some of you have taken and will take walks across the room, across the shop floor, across the restaurant, that you will greet others, get to know others, and you will encourage them that they might someday, somehow, lean on you as someone who might give them some hint of what it is to follow Christ. And in that regard, we have uh, said, get your story kind of compacted, it may, may not be quite a hundred words, it might be a little longer, but make your story clear so you can share with them your spiritual journey. And you have been kind enough to send me some of your stories. There was one I wanted to read today, as a matter of fact, and the person tells a little bit about herself in the intro, and enough so, so that I said, do you want me to share this? Because they might be able to figure out who it is, and Chris Ben said, it's okay. <laughs> you go ahead and let them know. So, uh, Here's how her story comes out. One thing about me is unmistakable, and people always notice. I am a small person. I couldn't take swim class in junior high because even the shallow end was almost over my head. Perhaps it was all the childhood teasing about my diminutive size, or maybe because I was the only girl with three brothers who made it known they didn't want me to tag along, or just my shy and sensitive nature that caused me to believe I was of little value or importance. My voice didn't matter much, or so I thought. Owing uh, all to the transformation power of the Lord, you would not recognize me as that person today. I'm not aware of the moment I officially crossed over from darkness into the light of God's saving grace. It has been a gradual process. I actually cannot remember a time I did not believe in God and know that he sent his son to die for me. As a child, the presence of the Lord was like a beautiful impressionist painting looming large in my life. I was always drawn to God's word, and when I heard it proclaimed in church or on TV, it touched my heart and warmed my soul. Nevertheless, I had a hard time picking up the Bible and understanding it. Then God did marvelous things in my life. He gave me a very godly husband, a new home 3,000 miles away, and a new friend who took me to a wonderful Bible study. I met mature Christians who mentored me, and we found a solid Bible-teaching church. Through those changes, as well as some unforgettable personal experiences, that fuzzy childhood image of God is slowly evolving into something more like a 3D picture in brilliant color. There are so many ways the Lord is changing me. He has given me compassion for the little people of this world, the ones who feel they do not count and have no voice. He has given me the courage to use my voice to serve him and others. He has given me the assurance that he values everything he has made. I have a long way to go, but Philippians 1, 6 tells us we can be confident that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. As the hymn goes, little is much when God is in it. Isn't that great? So now when you see Chris, you can say that is a great, great story. Well, I hope you'll continue to share stories with me and with others. And I hope that you will stay open to how the Lord might use you to share his love with others. We can all take this walk across the room. But today we're going from a theme to a book in the Bible. And so throughout the summer and probably into the fall, I want us to walk step by step through the book of James. There is a whole lot to chew on in this book and there will be lots of life application for every single one of us. But first, any tour of a book of the Bible, you need to know some background. You need to know who wrote it and what the circumstances are. And right now, you're probably thinking, well, let me take a wild guess. It's called the book of James. So I'm thinking James wrote it. And right you are, I think. But there are six possible Jameses who could have written it. Think about that. First of all, in Jesus' disciples, among Jesus' disciples were two Jimmies that were with him, and they sometimes call him James the Greater, James the Lesser. And it is often said, and, and, and it is said about James that he is the brother of Jesus. We don't know if that was one of those disciples or not, so that's a third option. Plus, there's some evidence that this James might be James of Alphaeus, and maybe that meant that his dad married 
Mary after Joseph had died. And in the book of Jude, he introduces himself the same way you'll see that James introduces himself with this difference. He calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ, but a brother of James. So did Mary, the mother of Jesus, have other children? We don't know. Or by brother, is that kind of a, did that mean a cousin who grew up with him? Or is it sort of brothers in arms? I could go further, but I'm sure you get the point. So whether or not we know James' exact biological connection to Christ, we know that this person, James, was absolutely central to the early church. When we read in the book of Galatians that Paul, is, his authority is being questioned, one of the first lines of defense he has is that he says that he cleared his understanding of the gospel with James. When the decision is finally made about the great issue of the day for them, which is, shall Gentiles be considered on an equal footing with Jews? And that decision is made in Acts 15. There is a council that decides that, and the head of that council is James. He is known as James the Just, and he is, as I say, he is the key leader of all those Christians there in Jer Jerusalem. So that's a bit of a sketch of who wrote it. Well, when was it written? Scholars are also divided on that. Some say it is the first book in the New Testament. It was written before any of the Apostle Paul's letters. Others say it was after the Apostle Paul's letters. Just to help you out, I think it's about the same time as the Apostle Paul's letters. The point about when he wrote it is understanding the context in which this thing is written. What, is, what was happening among the early church? Well, you'll recall that we had the day of Pentecost. Here we are. And 3,000 came to Christ. And then they talked to others. And the encouragement and the excitement grew. And so the church was just growing like, wild, like wildfires. But it was all happening there in Jerusalem. And this is what we read about how sweet their fellowship was. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. I mean, it's like a scene out of Woodstock except centered around Jesus. Everything is wonderful, things are going great, but dark clouds started rolling in. All those, those uh, religious leaders were getting a little tired of these people saying, that guy that you had crucified was in fact the Messiah. And so they couldn't take it anymore. They, they arrest Stephen and they bring him before the Sanhedrin and he is giving his defense of the faith. And when he ends, this is what we read. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, somewhat like that, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this will forever change the life of that nascent Christian group who consider themselves just as Jewish as anybody else. Their only difference was that they had found the Messiah. This then is the context for James's letter. We read, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So they had left their homes, they had left their work, they had left, they had left the, the region in which they had lived for generations, they traveled away with what they could place on their back or what they could put in an ox cart, there were, I'm sure, tearful goodbyes, there was uncertainty about the future, the church was scattered. And that group that once had the world by the tail, who knew that Jesus was coming back next Thursday, and all their challenges, all their concerns, all that is in the rear view mirror, now that group finds themselves on these dusty roads, staying with relatives until they can figure out the next steps. 
In short, they are just about as far from pure joy as you could ever get. Or were they? Here is how James begins his letter to the church scattered. We can have that up here. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's pray. God, we give to you now our attention, our minds, our hearts, that you might shape us to be those people who persevere, to be those who are mature. In Jesus' name, amen. As I say, James is a key figure in the church. He has legacy. He may be related to Jesus. He certainly has status. He could have called himself by his title. He is somebody. But what he describes himself is with this little phrase. He is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This week, I, I um, became a member of Rotary. And uh, to do that, they, I mean, one thing they do is they want to introduce you. And so in my introduction lists my different uh, degrees and the different places in which I've served and that's an introduction of me and that's fine it would probably leave a few questions if they just said Stuart Bond a servant of God and Jesus Christ but it's important to remember this and this becomes your first fill in if you will that is it doesn't matter what your degrees are it doesn't matter what your title is, your position, your age. We are at bottom a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let that be our true identity. So that's who this letter is from. The next question is who it is, to whom it is addressed. And the answer is the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Why does he call them that? Because ancient Israel was, as you know, divided into 12 tribes. And they were those chosen people of God. And it's not by accident that Jesus chose 12 disciples. They represent the 12 tribes. And so 12 represents the entirety of God's people. He is saying that these Christians, they are now the inheritors of the promises of God. But like those first Israelites, while they were chosen, it doesn't mean that their route was easy. They too were refugees. They were wandering in a desert. They were looking for God's direction. And these Jewish Christians are scattered. The word for scattered is diaspora. That's the Greek word. It's the word used about Jews, the Jewish diaspora all over the world. And that's what these Christians were experiencing. And James wants them to know that even in their challenges, even in their trudging with those ox carts, with children that they're trying to carry, and imagine all the terrible dislocation they went through. We see it in refugees every day now on the news. That even then, they are the 12 tribes. They are precious to God. That's your second feeling. They are chosen. And it's in... In those circumstances, and in that context, that James talks about pure joy. But his words conjure a picture like nothing any of you said to one another, I'll bet. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Who here said, man, that's when I experience true joy, when I face a trial? Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that so much. And, and, and when would we ever thank God for our trials? Lord, you know, 
I had that situation with this woman. It was so difficult, and I, I didn't know what to do with her in the job, and I finally had to fire her. I couldn't sleep for a week. Thank you so much, God. I appreciate that. Lord, I have to have this conversation with my dad. He needs to stop driving. And I look forward to it just about as much as I look forward to having a lobotomy. I don't want to do it. Thank you, Lord. You think of the various trials you have faced, the challenges you have gone through. Have you ever considered that pure joy? And by the way, this ought to stand forever in the way of anyone who'd say that if you're truly following Christ, your life is going to be easy. These people, what do they do wrong? They've lost their homes, they've lost their livelihood, they've lost friends, they've lost family. But he says they're part of the 12 tribes. Maybe you've been in a terrible car accident. Maybe you've lost someone who is precious to you. Maybe you've had financial reversals. Does any of that mean that you are out of the Lord's will? Is the Christian life this smooth glide with no no snags? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In other words, and this is a fill-in, trials are going to happen. And when that time comes... That man or woman who has made a deal with God, who has said, as long as you give me your protection, I'll serve you. As long as my life is good, I'll do what you have asked me to do. That person is going to feel betrayed. God, how could you? It is not fair. And it is not fair. And come to think of it, the cross wasn't too fair either. But that man or woman who begins from the place of saying, I am your servant, Lord, who says, my life was bought with a price and my life is yours, body and soul. That person says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, the point of this is not just to go through trials for trials' sake. It's not just masochism. There is a real point. He writes, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. My understanding is that when you lift weights, and you can see that I'm constantly doing that, that as you do so, what makes your muscles sore is that the muscle fiber actually breaks down. And when it recovers, it gets bigger and it gets stronger. And so what this is all about, all that hard work, and, and you know, you always have workout people who say, you need to push to the last bit because when you're truly tired, when your cardio is really going, that is when you're getting the benefit. And so a Christian without perseverance, I brought my own prop here, he, uh, what do you think? And I'm in with Kathy's workout group, and I'm ready, you know. And a Christian without perseverance is like the person in the workout class is going, one, two, one, two. Oh, gosh, I don't know if I can do any more. I think I'm done for the day. Or the person lifting weights is going, oh, one, and I'm done. And that's how it is. But a Christian with perseverance, what is that person like? Sometimes they're facing this trial and then that trial. Sometimes it comes as a whole group of things. But that person is getting stronger every day. On the good days, you see a smile on his face, and you can see the courage in his eyes. And on a bad day, he may not have a smile on his face, but you can still see the courage in his eyes. Because he's built up that muscle of perseverance. He has gained that goal of maturity, and he knows that he is chosen in God's love. Hard times are no excuse to give up on God or to act unchristian. In fact, that is the very moment when you will live in such a way that years later you can speak about it to someone else when they need encouragement. You'll be able to say, you know, that diagnosis threw me, but God was faithful and we walked through it together. 
you'll be able to say, when I was going through all that, the pressure was pretty bad. So I had to pray more often. There's an old saying that I really like. There is no testimony without the test. The road to maturity, it's not marked by easily drifting through the stages of growing up. The road to maturity is marked by tests and trials. And there isn't a person here who is not able to tell some stories about hanging in there and about, and about God being faithful to us in that struggle. Now, of course, James and every one of those scattered Christians wanted a sunny day. They wanted some joy, and none of them looked forward to trials. And we want the same, and we certainly want the same for our children and for our grandchildren. We want it to be like Disneyland for them. We want to see little Faith Lynn up on that screen having a wonderful birthday, and so she should. But if that is every day, what does she become? How many American dolls can you have? We know that her life will not always be like it was in that store. She'll experience heartaches. She'll have her challenges. She'll face her failures. And the question is, even through her tears, will she count it pure joy? Will she realize even in her sense of exile, which we all experience, that she is chosen and precious? Will she accept the idea that God is maturing her so that she becomes a person whose faith is set for the long haul and not just for the moment? And of course, the real question is, will we do that? Probably most of you can identify a challenge or two that you have right now. Can any, does anyone have a challenge in their life right now? Could I see the hands? Those of you who don't have a challenge, just you can opt out here. But if you can think about that challenge, it's a situation you're facing. It's a person. It's at work. It's at home. Whatever it is, I want you to think about that challenge, and I want you to just turn it a little and look at it, at it a little different way. I want you to think about yourself some months or even some years from now looking back on this time. And what is it you want to say about yourself as you acted then? What is the testimony that you want to be able to make? Maybe you want to say, you know, I was tempted. I was tempted to give up, but I didn't. Maybe you want to be able to say some years from now, I was aching in my spirit. I wanted to just go dark, but I kept leaning on the Lord. Maybe you want to say, I... I I knew it was difficult, but I, I decided not to waver from what I needed to do, and God was with me. So begins the book of James. To a people scattered, a people who, who might have felt disillusioned, he says, we're all just servants of God. We are all chosen. We are all facing trials. But you know what? God is right there strengthening your faith in the very center of that trial. So hold on to him. And I say to you, hold on, friends. Trust. In our trials, exercise the muscle of faith so that you might know perseverance, maturity, and pure joy. May we pray together. God, we, we recognize ourselves in this picture of a people and we face trials because we faced a few and we've got a few. But you are a faithful God. And we pray that as we give of our resources now that these resources would be used to encourage and strengthen others. And we pray that we would remain faithful in these present trials and those that are to come. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence.
that very presence is with you whatever trials you face go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said Amen